The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the sixth Doctor story, Terror of the Vervoids. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Very well, thanks. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Folks, we want to encourage you to write an Apple podcast review of The Secrets of Doctor Who, because not just because we like to hear nice things, but because it also helps us find new listeners. And it also helps when you share the podcast with your friends, help us grow this awesome community of Doctor Who fans that we've got here. Uh, that's really helpful for us. And I also want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network that I'm sure you'll enjoy called The Secrets of Technology, where we look at technology news from a distinctly Catholic point of view, where we, we bring our Catholic sensibility to talking about whatever's in the news, but also hints and tips on how to use technology to the best. We don't approach it like uh, ultra geeks, we try to bring it to the regular folk, and so we hope you'll enjoy that. Find that wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash technology. So this is the Sixth Doctor story, Terror of the Vervoids. It's part of the Trial of the Time Lord season, and it's the second to last installment. Uh, let me put it that way. It's four episodes, but it's the second to last uh, solid story installment of that season and of the Sixth Doctor on TV. So. Uh, we're getting to the end there. So, Jimmy, could you give us a recap of what happens in Terror of the Vervoids? Last time on Trial of a Time Lord, the Doctor's companion Perry died after her brain was brutally swapped with an evil alien and her sort of boyfriend rushed in and blasted her to bits. This time, the Doctor presents an incident from his personal future, which he hasn't experienced yet, but that he's watched in The Matrix. It features new perky companion Mel, it's set on a Starliner in the 30th century that's transporting a bunch of people to Earth. Among the people are a professor and her assistants who are hiding murderous plant creatures known as vervoids. The vervoids are a biological hazard and will kill everything on Earth if even one of them arrives. One of the professor's assistants goes rogue and starts killing people to keep the secrets from being discovered. Then the vervoids go rogue and start killing everyone they can. They end up killing all of the passengers and many of the crew. But the Doctor uses unobtainium to create intense light and carbon monoxide, fast-forwarding their plant life cycles and aging them to death. Back in the courtroom, the Doctor thinks that the fact the commander of the spaceship explicitly asked him to intervene proves him innocent of the charge of meddling. But the Valyard turns the tables on him and, and announces that by killing all of the Vervoids, the doctor has proved that he is actually guilty of genocide. Dum dum dum. The end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. That. That. Thank you for that uh, recap. That is a good recap. So, a couple of things to start it's with. It's nice to have one that doesn't have like forty <laughs> elements after flux. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's fairly. It's pretty straightforward. This is basically an Agatha Christie story. You know, uh, a you know murder on a train sort of story, right? Yeah. Or, that, that which oh they in, in called fact out explicitly they called it out explicitly with having murder yeah. on the Orient, Orient Express and other Agatha Christie novels on the show yeah that's true yeah yeah <laughs> laying around in the in the various scenes uh, that's right I did notice that um, I I think I thought except that... except in well I won't spoil the end of Murder on the Orient Express but it's different than what happens here yes that is true um, a couple interesting things it so Perry is gone. Perry is, as far as we know, dead. Although, I think in extended media, uh, she's there's not. more. There's more to say about Perry, but not for this episode. Okay, not all right, all right. Spoilers. I have not seen. I have not seen those yet, so we, let's not spoil me. Um, but I think it's interesting that they kind of do this. Uh, you know, as a time traveler, I'm going to talk about something I haven't done yet <laughs> that you have yeah. a record mm -hmm. of, and I think that's kind of interesting and cool to do here. Yeah, very uh, river songy. <laughs> right, right. Well, well of course, that could also be seen as a poke in the eye of the trial, saying, well, obviously I'm going to survive this trial because here's the future event that's going to happen that hasn't happened yet. Well, that's true. Like, <laughs> how, now that you bring that up, 
So how does that not just invalidate the trial? I mean, it's or we don't have fixed point in time, time as a concept t- yet. Time can be rewritten. Okay. And yep. in fact, as we'll learn in the last two episodes of Trial of a Time Lord, which are the final part, it's only two parts long. Um, but in the final segment of Trial of a Time Lord, we learn the Doctor's entire future is definitely on the line. Mm-hmm. Okay. And and this this story is a doctor like so the prosecution has rested the doctor's presenting his defense that's what this is right you mentioned that mm-hmm. um and uh, so we meet melanie bush who uh becomes primarily the the seventh doctor's companion for a bit but not for very long melanie doesn't stick around very long does she no she's got like six stories or something like that by the way her last name bush is from the extended media she's never called that on the show i oh. believe that's a big finish original Oh, mm-hmm. okay. All right. She's, guess, she, he always yeah. introduces her as Melanie called Mel. Okay. Yep. Oh, but my wife's name is Melanie. Don't ever call her Mel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so since we're talking about uh, Mel, let's talk about the, um, the character, since we have a new character introduction yeah. here. So the, ac- the actress is Bonnie Langford, and she was known for playing uh, musical theater roles. She hadn't done a lot of television. Um, but she was very popular and known for that. In fact, she was known for playing Peter Pan Mm. and there was a a publicity photo they did of her as Peter Pan with Colin Baker as the doctor. Mm -hmm. And she is just like, um, just like each new doctor is kind of a reaction to the previous doctor. It's like, let's make him different. Yeah. Wow. Do we have a difference between (laughs) Mel and Perry? Yeah. Perry was kind, and I like the actress. I like Nicola Bryant. I think they get, did her poorly by writing bad stuff for mm-hmm. her to say. But wow, she was her character was constantly complaining and whining and just you know mm. unpleasant, frankly. Yeah. And um, it, with flashes of oh, she's a nice person, but she would always just re- re- revert to complaining and whining. Yeah. And Mel is the total opposite of that. Mel is perky. Mel is enthusiastic. Mel is take charge. Mel in this story in particular is like let's let's rush head into danger. Mm-hmm. Where whereas, you know, Perry was always, "Oh, doctor, I think this is dangerous. Do we have to do this?" And Mel is like <laughs> We've got a distress call. We've got to go answer this. Why are you being so reluctant, Doctor? You're out of character. <laughs> right, right. Well, and th- yeah, uh, what was I going to say? Um, the Doctor actually likes Mel, whereas mm-hmm. I didn't feel like he li- liked Perry very much. <laughs> you know, like he kind of inherited her, but it's not, you never got the sense that he was all that, that they liked each other all that much. Whereas you get the sense that Mel and the Doctor are friends. You get the sense by by the time we get to the Ravelox one, um, I'm blanking on the name of it. It's the first part of Trial of a Time Lord. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You you some time has passed, and you get the sense with them as they're walking through the woods that they they do like each other now and they're enjoying each other's company. But right. it took a while to get there, and and Perry still hasn't stopped whining. Yeah, yeah. The other interesting thing about Mel is that we meet her sort of in the middle. We don't know how she got on the TARDIS. Do we ever find out? Only in extended media. Oh, right. It right. is. It is. It is never covered on screen. Right. Yeah. I mean, in well, fact, th- I've, there's only one other story where I have not seen. You know, one of Mel TV story that I haven't seen yet, which is the next Six Doctor one. I've seen her yeah. in, the, in complete run with the Seventh Doctor. So yeah. Now, one thing Mel is known for, as you hear several times throughout this episode, is her scream. Yes. She's, and of course, uh, you know, the, the, Bonnie Langford is, you know, she's an accomplished singer. She's pitch perfect to the point where this is the f- episode where the famous scream that matches the opening note of the closing music. Right. I was listening Number for nine. that. It's pretty close. It's not a perfect not exact. match. Yeah. <laughs> but I, also, I also read that they, it, they manipulated the screen screamed to but, make it match but yeah. i'm not sure yeah, about but, that but yeah the, the story goes though that she was told at the end of episode nine of trial time lord first episode of this serial that she she screamed twice first time was a higher pitch second time was a lower pitch and that lower pitch was supposed to be right into the closing music it was okay. supposed to be the same pitch yeah you're you're right jimmy it wasn't an exact match but you could tell that her pitch had changed between the two 
mm-hmm. two screams. And that's part of her training as a musician. She was able to do that. Right. Yeah, key change. Singer. Yeah. Incidentally, Mel is a little bit divisive in the fandom. Uh, some fans don't like Mel. They think she's too perky. But frankly, to me, I love Mel. She's a breath of fresh air. I like her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. She also gets some, in some of the extended media at Big Finish, she she really does some interesting stuff. Um, her her time with Sabalom Glitz, where she goes to rehabilitate him, mm-hmm. <laughs> it, 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 she... She kind of gets a little dehabilitated herself. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> I, I believe one of the uh, one of the first stories that where they re- reintroduce her, if I recall correctly, it's called a life of crime. Okay, mm. funny, funny. Okay, yeah, the, he's a bad influence on her. Um, there is also a, another character like we mentioned the uh, the the commander of the this freighter, this passenger freighter that they, they're traveling on, uh, Comm- Commodore Travers. And the doctor and Travers know each other. They they've had they've had a past encounter apparently, and yeah. the Commodore knows like he he doesn't quite look quite like the doctor because as we all know wherever the doctor shows up, chaos ensues. Uh, but he also knows that if he leaves the doctor to do his thing, he's gonna find out whoever in this case whoever the killer is on board his ship. And so, you know, so it's it's an interesting relationship that's going on here. It's sort of an adversarial, but I'm I'm tolerating you relationship. I like that. Yeah, the Commodore also, like the Doctor at one point says, hey, I saved your life. And the Commodore is like, yeah, and you were the one who endangered it in the first place. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and and this is one of two characters that the Doctor already knows personally. The other is an investigator that is undercover on the Starliner because apparently there have been reports of criminal activity. And so you have this undercover investigator whose his real name is Hallett, but mm-hmm. he's going as Mr. Grenville. Yeah. And it's he him who sends the distress call we later learn. He sent the distress call that brought the doctor and Mel there. So that's how the doctor gets involved is because he already knew this investigator. And I actually like having people notice this is also very River Song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The in Silence in the Library, Stephen Moffat said the reason he wrote River Song the way he did, he didn't know he was going to become showrunner. Um, right. He just needed a reason for someone to instantly trust the Doctor, and thought Companion from the Future is a way of doing that. But this is similar. This is, and we've seen this in a few other episodes, even in Colin Baker's time. I forget which one it is, but there's an earlier Colin Baker where there's an allusion to a third Doctor adventure on, uh, maybe it's Peladon, but we we never, it's there's an allusion to a third Doctor adventure right. that we never saw. And here we've got another adventure, at least one, involving the, the Commodore and maybe a second involving uh, Hallett that we never saw. And I actually like that. I like wondering about these... Um, unseen adventures and you know imagining what they may have involved and it also speeds up the writing yep. because yep. if if Hallett knows the doctor that that explains the distress signal and gets him into the action and then the um the commodore knowing the doctor and tolerating him again it's like river song instantly trusting the doctor and the commodore instantly trusts the doctor enough to let him do his job and it also makes the the doctor the, the Doctor Who universe bigger. It feels like there's right. you know there's there's stuff beyond the the edge of the set. Yeah, mm-hmm. and they did they did come back and explore this in a, a book later. But you know as as Jimmy said before, the books are basically beta yeah. canon. They're they're really not part. You know, Big Finish has kind of become alpha canon, but the books are beta canon right. to my mind. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I agree with that too. So <laughs> yeah, Doctor Who's been around long enough that any thread that they leave hanging out there has been grabbed by somebody and <laughs> they ran with it. Yeah. So yeah. One thing that I also noticed in this is that Mel has clearly been traveling with the Doctor for some time in this adventure because she's like, this isn't normally like you. Why are you being so cautious? Right, right. This is, this is yeah, a bit in the future. And that's kind of interesting. I'm kind of curious to see uh, how that works with the end of the next doc, uh, Six Doctor story and the beginning with the regeneration uh, with the seventh doctor, you mentioned before, Jimmy, that I think in, when we talked about that the regeneration, that they kind of just jump. There's like they yeah. kind of there's no yeah. real explanation. 
there's well kind of sort of, not on screen there's the kind of sort of the ronnie is involved but but uh they offered colin baker a chance to come back for a four-part story and regenerate and he said no he was mm. he was mad big finish has now rectified that they've given him a formal story leading directly into the regeneration but yeah okay oh uh, also the fact that he's more cautious in this is essential to his case Yes. Mm -hmm. Because his argument is that even though he's meddled in the past, he improves in future. And, right. and so that him, him being more cautious and waiting to be directly invited and that kind of stuff and being more low key is part of his case, actually, that he's going to be more cautious in the future. Right. Unfortunately, the courtroom scenes continue to be terrible. <laughs> in this. It's just lots of formulaic, bombastic bickering. Yeah. Yep. Paint That's by true. numbers writing. You know, it's a, I understand why they did this from a production standpoint. Why the only story they go to is a six doctor event, you know, like the v event within the, and not, yeah, but if you're going to go to the future and see how he's changed, why not go far future, 12th doctor time? You know what I mean? I, I know you can't do that within uh, the bounds, spo but. Dom, spoilers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right then. All right. I'm I'm jumping ahead. I have not watched the next uh, story yet, so uh, that's good to hear. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll drop that thread and go to this other thing, which is the doctors continuing to object to changes in the Matrix recording of this future event. Like he he, as things happen, as he, they're watching the the recording of the future on the screen in the courtroom, he says, "Wait a minute, that didn't happen like that." Um, and I, it's very interesting that they can continue to do that. They haven't resolved that. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know. What do you they guys They will. Think? They will. Okay. They will. All right. And it's, they dropped hints of it early in, um, again, in the Ravelox episode, um, the something planet. Mysterious planet. The mysterious planet. Yeah. <laughs> and they, at Sabalom Glitz knows about the Matrix. They've got a, like, a hard drive from the Matrix in that episode. Mm -hmm. And you may remember there's a moment where Sablom Glitz says something on screen and it's bleeped out. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. And what he's referring to, if you go back and watch it, is that there have been alterations in The Matrix. Okay. Yep. And um, so he knows about The Matrix. He knows about the alterations in it. And that's going to come back. Okay. Well, it's, it's interesting they insist that The Matrix can't be changed, you know, because that, that comes up. And it's like, well, you've changed it enough to blurt out the fact that, and also that Ravelox is actually Earth moved, you know, light mm -hmm. years away. And it's just like, okay, you can change it to do that, but you can't change what people see off of it. Right, right. Yeah. That... Well, it, but that's what the doctor's objecting to here. Right. Like there's a moment where the, co the communications equipment on the Starliner has been smashed and the camera moves back to reveal it was the doctor who smashed it. And he says, that wasn't me. I never did that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, hmm. so the what you know the possible explanations for for that, but I, I won't necessarily go into that because spoilers, obviously. Um, so there's this plot of the the uh, vervoids that this professor, this mad scientist, we have yet another you know mad scientist who's mm -hmm. uh, taken science too far, and her two colleagues, her who, even matter assistant scientist, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> the what the reluctant one and the one who's even crazier. Who have created this new sentient species of plant life, uh, who are a lot like the plant people from the uh, Infinite Vulcan <laughs> from Star Trek animated yeah. series. Uh, uh, only, only the Infinite Bul Vulcan ones didn't look like this. No, no, yeah, no, they, they're still, yeah, they're plant people. But uh, so you have them; they're they're killing the humans because, and we find out because humans eat plants, and therefore it's a struggle for for survival, I guess. Uh, a, a, a uh, instinctual they're, response. They're, but, they're paying back for all the salads and <laughs> and stuff we've eaten over the years. Yeah, I, and I agree. From now on, I pledge only to eat steak. Yeah, but no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they they should have ended this one after after the previous episode where um they went to Spain and they met the Andragums. Yep. And mm. at the end of it, um, the doctor tells Perry, uh, after this, you and I are strict vegetarians. Yep. At the end of this, he should have said, after this, Mel, you and I are strict breatharians. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and that is a real group of people. The bre breatharians claim to be able to only consume the nutrients they need by breathing. 
Uh-huh. And 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 they get away with it until you find video of them snacking on cheeseburgers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say they don't last very long otherwise. Um so we have that that whole plot where the the vervoids are killing people, but there's also another plot going on with the, the, the people of this planet where they've originated Mogar that has this rare metal that is, you know, very expensive that this freighter is transporting, and the, some of the Mogarians are on board. And they end up taking over the ship with the help of the uh, about to retire security officer. Uh, they, they <laughs> Who also all- goes rogue all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. I love of all of the people suddenly going rogue. And and I, I was thinking I'm going to have to include that in my plot summary. And then, nope, it's over almost before it begins. So it's just a diversion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. It's kind of padding out the uh, the runtime so you get four full episodes, I think. It, who killed Grenville? I think I, I didn't catch that. It was um, so he was poisoned, mm-hmm. and it ultimately the death of Grenville is explained by the super crazy assistant scientist. Okay. He's he's the one who's doing all the killing of individual passengers. Okay, before the vervoids go rogue. Right then, the vervoids start killing and uh, stacking the bodies in the in the the ventilation shaft or something. There, by the way, there's a really creepy moment for that um, where we, you know. The doctor and per- uh, the doctor and Mel find this, you know, pile of human bodies mm. of all the people we've seen killed. You know, they got those actors to come here and lay down in a big heap. Right. And um, and Mel is like, "Oh, that's horrible." And the doctor says, "When you're in your garden and you pull a weed, what do you do with it?" And she <laughs> says, "Well, I throw it on a compost heap." <laughs> and it's like, "Oh, Ew. wow, that's a compost <laughs> yeah. heap for for plant based life." Uh, so apparently on this ship they don't launder towels they incinerate them after use because there's this one scene where the, uh, uh, several scenes take place in this gym where uh, we, we get to see Mel doing aerobics because you know uh, it's that time that period of history where people did a lot of aerobics and she gets knocked out and shoved in a laundry bin and then the doctor has to rescue her before being thrown into the incinerator it's not really an incinerator it's like a well, they, some, at one point they call it a pulverizer. Yeah, several <laughs> points actually. Right, and apparently that's what we do with our old towels. We don't <laughs> launder them; we throw them in there. But we, they, it creates this dramatic tension of the doctor rescuing Mel right at the last minute before she's thrown into the pulverizer. Uh, so I, I thought that was kind of a funny thing. One thing I'm kind of glad about for Mel is that this is the only place where you see her with the exercise kick. Yeah, mm-hmm. you don't really see it in the Seventh Doctor. Uh, and it doesn't help much that the first scene is literally her making the doctor ride this really awkward looking exercise bike and drinking carrot juice. And remember the carrot juice that will come back. Yes. Okay. What, what they're doing with that scene is they're hanging a lamp and they do it more than once, but they do it in the first scene where we get the doctor and Mel. Um, they're hanging, hanging a lantern on the fact that during the 18 month hiatus, between the previous season and this one where the BBC for the first time, like put Dr. Who on the shelf, you mm-hmm. know, and said, and didn't have a clear announcement of when it was coming back. Um, the doctor gained or Colin Baker gained a lot of weight. And so, oh. so that's what they're doing is they're explaining that by having him, uh, exercising. They're showing Mel having, you know, imposing a health kick on a health regimen on him. And he also later makes m- makes jokes about his own weight, mm. and and that's what they're doing. They're trying to explain that for the fans. Oh, okay. They then have him eat spray painted fava beans in the episode. <laughs> I I did enjoy that. Uh, as soon as her back is turned, like he's counting as he's doing his exercise. Yeah, that was that was he, fun. He stops yep. pedaling and just keeps counting. <laughs> like, like that. <laughs> it's a man after my own heart. Um, so. So we have the vervoids they wanted to kill all the people on board. We have the mad scientist assistant who's killing people who might discover their secret. And then we have the his, his others- plan by his plan yeah. by the way just to make it clear for listeners, he wants to take the, the, the all of them want to take the vervoids back to earth. Right. But what he wants to do there is is use them as slaves to replace the current robot slaves because the vervoids will like r- grow and all you all they need is sunlight and water i mean technically they need more than that but yeah. but all they need is sunlight and water and so the argument is they're going to be better than the robot slaves that we have to build now right it's an interesting uh, uh idea i'm not sure that makes i'm not sure that's mm. better but yeah 
<laughs> well, it, it <laughs> doesn't be free, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and the professor who invented them doesn't she she doesn't want to use them as slaves. I'm not clear on what her motive for what she wants to do with them is. Yeah. But she thinks the fact that, oh, they know me, they know I'm not a, I, they know I'm not wanting to enslave them, uh, I can talk to them. And the doctor's like going, no, you can't. And she's going, sure I can. And she goes over and starts talking to them. Hey, we're pals. You know, I don't want to enslave you, right? And they're like, you're an animal, don't care. Zap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're dead. <laughs> yeah. Her uh, arrogance is her, her downfall, which is, you know, a classic trope. Um, so well, it's the rule. Mad scientist has to fall victim to own invention. That's right. That's yep. right. Uh, then there's the other assistant who wants to destroy the ship because he doesn't want the vervoids to get to Earth because he knows that they'll take over and kill everyone. So that so I mean his his intention is good. That is to stop <laughs> the destruction of Earth. No. <laughs> Perhaps there might have been a better way of going about that. Yeah, I like that character. He's fascinating. He's this is the first of the two sudden takeovers of the ship yep. Uh, yep i mean we have serial takeovers happening here and his is the first because he's been mr hey i've got a conscience i'm not happy about this i think we ought to you know do this differently and then his solution once he once he he, he eventually snaps and he's the one with the conscience and he then snaps and says let's drive the ship into a black hole right yep yeah well that um yeah his name's bruckner and uh, I, I do like the fact that as soon as the vervoids figure out what he's doing, they're like, we have to make his death top, top priority. Let's go get him. Yeah. So, but the they fighting... literally gas him. They yes. literally gas him. They can expel swamp gas, basically. Right, right. And as the ship is heading into the black hole, I'm sitting there going, you know, if there was only a way for everyone on board to be able to fit into this one tiny escape ship that's shaped like a telephone box. That you could yeah, get right. into and get off the ship. And, and if only. If only. If only had someone remembered that the TARDIS was in the don't, cargo hold. Don't be ridiculous, Dom. That's just science fiction. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right, right. right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least give us TARDIS separation for some reason. You know, put the, maybe the vervoids surrounded it with vines and they couldn't get through them. I don't know. But yeah, they forgot that. Um, so, yeah. So they, they saved the ship. Um, Bruckner is aiming to the black hole. Then the Bulgarians hijack the ship with the help of Rudge. What a great name. <laughs> Rudge secure, holds the grudge. Sec security guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and then the killer, whoever the killer is, kills the Bulgarians. And then uh, there is at one point where the doctor asks for a weapon. I, if if mm -hmm. you notice that. He, he yes. has one of those phasers. One, one of the pla upside down plastic drill guns. <laughs> yes, yeah. I noticed because that. Because they clearly went down to Home Depot and got a bunch of plastic drills and then turned them upside down to make guns out of them. <laughs> yeah, yep. it was clearly. Why are you holding that the wrong way? Um, <laughs> but yeah. so he he does ask for a um, he does ask for a weapon, and that's notable. He's I like the refreshing you know way of dealing with this. Um, the. Hmm. Had a thought and it oh. got away from me. Sorry. Oh, oh no, sorry. I, I think I, I, I drove that out. Uh, but uh, so the ultimate guy is. Uh, so Doland is is, oh. is the uh, assistant. I I remember what it is oh, okay. now. Okay. Um. So yeah, Doland is the super crazy guy who, and he ends up killing the Magarans after they've taken over the spaceship. But yep. there is a there there is another character in this that we haven't mentioned. Her name is Janet. And right. she's basically customer service. You know, she's there to uh, to be of assistance to the. She, I, I, she's not. I don't think a cruise director, but she's <laughs> going to say that. Think, you <laughs> think know, a she, flight attendant. She's think like a flight a, attendant. She's kind of like a flight attendant, and yeah. so she's there to assist the passengers and have them have a pleasant journey. And and she's fine as a character. Yeah. Um. But because of some fans not liking Bonnie Langford as Mel, they developed fan a fan proposal where what the doctor should have done was ditch Mel and take Janet as the new assistant. Okay. And, you know, if that's your fantasy, okay, fine. But there is a... They were trying to do all this misdirection, you know, because this is a mystery story. Yep. And there is an artifact of an of an apparently an earlier draft where Janet was the killer. 
Oh. Because if you notice the Mogarans, when they're sitting in the, in the flight deck and they're in yep. control and their killer shows up, we only see this from the killer's point of view. We don't see mm -hmm. who the killer is. We later learn it's super mad scientist assistant Doland. But when, when, they, when the killer shows up, the Mogarans turn and look at the killer and say, what are you doing here? We didn't order any refreshment. Yep. Right, right. Yep. That's yeah, I right. was wondering about that. I was wondering if there was some other plot line that they were trying to go with that they ended up scrubbing because yeah. of that line. Apparently, that was, e that was either unintentional, uh, an unintentional artifact of an earlier draft or it was deliberate misdirection towards Janet. Because there was a moment where I think it was a Mel went and um, in, uh, investigated a room and that sort of thing, where that was the point where we were supposed to start suspecting that maybe Janet is the killer. But, yeah. Right. yeah. One thing we haven't mentioned is the uh, the scientist crew from from coming back from Mogar has a person mm -hmm. in, a, in a sort of bio bed in an isolation yeah. room. And this... Mm -hmm person was the assistant to the assistant Doland, and she got infected with a, a vervoid spore during a crucial transfer, gene transfer thing or something, and she's like half vervoid now. Yep. And she, she just lays there. She's, she's yeah. a distraction. She doesn't really enter into the plot. She's, she lays there and provides body horror and eventually dies. Because mm -hmm. the confusing. vervoid's a killer. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was kept waiting for her existence to be important to the plot, and it really never was. No. Except, uh, except to have a room that no one was supposed to go into. Right. The fact they have an isolation room within the crew or the passenger quarters, you know. Yeah. I, that's I, it. I, I do like, they've, so they've set it up, you need a, a special mask to go into the room, yep. and, um, and it's being guarded by guards from the Starliner. And Mel is telling the doctor, you know, how are you going to get in there? You're never going to get that guard away and you don't have a mask and stuff like that. And the doctor just turns to the wall where there is firefighting equipment and smashes the glass and takes out a fire axe and turns to the guard and says, quick down there, passengers are in the lounge. And he hands the, the man the axe <laughs> yeah. and the fire alarm is going off. And then he takes the firefighting mask off yeah. the wall and puts it on and i thought that was that was nice that was good yeah, yeah that was a good little uh gag uh because that guard was not the brightest bulb on that christmas tree no <laughs> so uh you know we, and, and we end up as you mentioned in the summary they end up he releasing this uh, mineral that accelerates their vervoid life cycle and, and yeah. kills them they, all they call it vionesium but it's just another form of unobtainium right right it's it's like magnesium only better yeah. And it, yeah. Oh, and for unobtainium for people who have seen um what is it, Avatar? Mm -hmm. They did not invent that word for Avatar. Right. That mm. that has been around science fiction for decades. Yeah. 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 That, yeah, James Cameron just kind of appropriated it. <laughs> yeah. What a shock. Uh, yeah. So and then as we mentioned, uh, the the trial, we, we go back to the trial, the the, the where the uh the Valyard upgrades the charges to uh, genocide. And it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a specious little maneuver. I, I mean, who knows how Gallifrey and justice works, but that's kind of a <laughs> dumb, like, really? Oh, I mean, you're, 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 um, the accused has just admitted genocide. Well, it's, yeah. I, that would, I mean, certainly, I mean, you can argue was this justified or not, but he just admitted genocide. If I'm a prosecutor, I'm going to try to get a new charge filed. Well, except they were, they were a sort of mutant species just created in a lab. Uh, you know, I they, know, but think like a lawyer. It's your your job is to right. prosecute this guy. This guy has just admitted genocide. <laughs> oh, well, let's introduce that. Except, yeah, well, I mean the. The judge should should be okay. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> but now, yeah. what what the judge could have done is said, okay, fine, we'll have a new trial on that charge. Yeah, but the judge wouldn't necessarily have to do that. I mean, right. Gallifreyan law could say, oh, well, we've just had all the evidence introduced. You know, let's uh, let's let's look at that evidence in greater detail right. and argue about its significance. Yeah. Well, and we'll see how, I mean, it ends in the, with him pronouncing that and nothing, we don't know what's going to happen next until we see it. So 
you know, I'll, I'll let it go. Uh, any other notes on this episode, Father Corey? So I got a kick out that uh, there was a scene in the lounge where the couple of Megarians are playing Hollow Galaga. They're playing <laughs> the, the video ah, game Ga- Ga- Galaga <laughs> on a hologram. You guys kept me waiting. I was gonna. I was getting ready in the final wrap up to say you fi- you falsified one of my predictions, but uh, <laughs> I, I have in my notes. Father C and Dom will talk about primitive video game. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. I noticed that immediately. Resist? Yeah, Galaga. Yeah, that's right. It was. It was a Galaga. I thought it was Space Invaders, but I guess it was Galaga. Yeah. No, it was Galaga. It yeah. was. It was the newer version. <laughs> that's um, awesome. Newer they, game, and then there's, they have a there's two, one two D holographic display for it though, which makes yeah, it science it's, fictiony. It's, yeah, yeah. It's it's not even like complete three D, even if it is the marching across the screen. But anyways. So he had that, and then there's one character we didn't mention because basically he was there to expose the investigator and then die. Oh, right. And that was Mr. Kimber, yes, who was played man. by Arthur Hewlett, who's, you know, if you watch any British TV show, he's everywhere. He was oh, everywhere yeah. about this time. But Doctor Who would know him. He was in State of Decay, the, the vampire East Space uh, serial mm-hmm. of the fourth Doctor. He was one of the, the peasants, one of the, uh, whatever you want to call it, the, the townspeople. Uh, that were under the influence of the the vampires. So he's been on Doctor Who before, but somebody that should be somewhat familiar, like I said, if you've watched British TV, because he was very prolific in 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 that that field. Cool, cool, excellent. Uh, Jimmy, you have any uh, notes? So um, this has elements of Alien in it, mm-hmm. and one of the ways it has elements of Alien is the Vervoids have these kind of body parts that are that like leap out and stab people kind of like the alien's mouth in in the movie alien sure Mm -hmm. and they do that at one point like they stab mr kimber in the neck um and they also but they also have them in their hands and one of the or that may be just where they have them is in their hands but it like Mm -hmm. it's it's a thing that leaps out and stabs somebody and uh one of the authors from the New Who era, who wrote the Handbot episode, mm-hmm. where you have the robots that that kill with their by something like oh, anesthetizing yeah. you with their hand, mm-hmm. he was terrified of the vervoids and what they were doing with their hands, and said that may have been a subconscious inspiration for the Handbots later on. Okay, <laughs> um, but you do have uh, them doing that to people, and like at one point, uh, Doland, the crazy assistant scientist is trying to make friends with them, even though they've heard him plotting their enslavement. <laughs> right. Yep. And he, like, tries to shake hands with them. And it's like, <laughs> dude, do you know what they can do with their hands? <laughs> yeah, and they do. And, <laughs> and they, it's like, so you have this deadly handshake. Yeah. Also, I thought it was significant the doctor asked for a phaser specifically. You have Star Trek uh, jargon bleeding through in right. this because right. the term phaser was created for Star Trek. That's true. Yeah, and that's, yeah, this postdates Star Trek. Yeah, in its Just creation. like you have a reference to a cloaking device in Star Wars. Yep. True. That's very true. All right. I think that should do it for our discussion of Terror of the Vervoids. I have to say, you know, for a Six Doctor story, you know, they've been uneven before, but I, I kind of like this one. This was a pretty good one. This is better. Certainly nice not to have all the whining. <laughs> That's yeah. The, the, the lack of whining was an upgrade. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including Debbie A., Bob M., Joe B., Sean M., and Mark C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us every week. So that's it from us. What do you think of the Terror of the Vervoids, this six Doctor story? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page, or send an email to doctorwho at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the 11th Doctor story, The Crimson Horror. Until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me and sharing the Secrets of Doctor Who. Thanks, Tom. Father Corey Stika, thank you as well. Thank you, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, satiable curiosity, like the elephant's child. I have no idea what that's referencing.
Oh, that's uh, from the Just So Stories by Rudyard Kipling. Uh, the Rudyard. It's how, how the elephant got its trunk. The elephant's child couldn't resist investigating a crocodile, which bit on its nose and stretched it out. Awesome. <laughs>